Epiphany means appearing or manifestation or revealing. On the second Sunday of Epiphany, we see Jesus manifest or reveal his glory at, of all places, a wedding. And he, and he performs, as St. John says, his first of his miraculous signs. Um, and John calls it a sign, not, not just a miracle, but a miracle which signifies something greater. It's a sign. It actually has something to teach us, a word from God. When I begin marriage counseling classes, I like to, to point out that the Bible actually begins and ends with a wedding. At the very beginning in Genesis, at the creation of the world, God forms a wife, Eve, for Adam and institutes marriage. And then at the very end of the Bible in Revelation, at the revealing of the new creation, the church or the bride of Christ is united to Jesus, her heavenly bridegroom. And so there's something significant going on here that Jesus uses a wedding as an occasion for his first sign. In ancient Jewish culture, a wedding was a big deal. We think our weddings are a big deal today with all the time and especially the money that we put into them. But ours have nothing on theirs. These wedding feasts or receptions, if you want to call them, that would last for up to seven days. And, and the bride and groom wouldn't receive just a, a kitchen aid mixer as a gift, but the gifts uh, that they would receive here were understood to be more like loans, and which, uh, if the feast was a flop, the guests could, according to Jewish civil law, take back their gifts, take back their loans. Sometimes I kind of wish we still had that today. So if you were a bride or a groom, a problem at your wedding meant shame and dishonor to you and all of your guests. This wasn't just kind of an oops moment, but shame for the rest of your life kind of thing, a thing you could never get past. And so you see the problem brewing, and you can hear the tenseness in Mary's words when she comes to Jesus and says, they have no more wine. Well, we don't exactly have the same type of cultural expectations at our weddings uh, or wedding banquets today. If we're talking about marriage in particular, and broadly speaking, the sixth commandment and God's gift of physical intimacy, there is one thing that always hangs around if something goes wrong or if this gift gets abused. Shame. Now, we have to be clear about this because God's view of marriage and sex is not the same as the world's view. The world shames chastity and ridicules virginity. Sexual promiscuity of every sort is expected and admired. And thanks to the internet, pornography has become pandemic. All this to the extent that, that otherwise healthy uh, young men and women find themselves incapable to function in relationships and marriages the way God intended them to. Rather, the world encourages these sinful things. And if you don't believe me, uh, the, the shutting down of various social media sites this past week by big internet companies reveals just how easy it would have been to shut down internet pornography years ago. You know, the world encourages these things, but then abandons you when the real and deeper shame starts to be felt. Because primarily the misuse of God's gift of physical intimacy is not a moral issue, but a spiritual one. It's not that sexual sins are, are any worse, but they are the most defiling and degrading, subjectively speaking. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but these a person commits against and inside his own body against the other person's body, and against, as St. Paul says, against the body of Christ himself, the church. Sins of this sort, whether done or done to, 
leave a lot of damage in their wake, not only psychologically and emotionally, but spiritually as well. It defiles and desecrates our bodies, which God says is his temple. And those who have been sinned against in this regard especially know this deeply. That once something has been defiled and desecrated, there's no going back. But that's why Jesus, being at this wedding and performing a sign is so important, so restorative, and so refreshing for those who feel this shame. St. John gives us an important detail about the wedding. He says, six stone water jars, which the Jews used for ceremonial washing or cleansing, were standing there, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. So it's about 120 gallons total. Now, the Jewish law prescribed that when guests arrived at a wedding, the servants would wash their hands. So this is bath water. This is what makes Jesus washing in the upper room so remarkable. He doesn't wash hands, he washes feet. But the reason the guests' hands were washed was so that they could be ritually pure. And so they would have clean and sanitary hands, yes. But clean, shame-free, and joyful hearts, no. See, commandment-keeping cannot bring us life. It cannot remove the impurity of something already defiled. The law only increases our shame or blinds us to the fact that we are the ones doing the shaming. The law is is just as effective to purify and cleanse as as 120 gallons of bath water were at gladdening the hearts of wedding guests at a feast without wine. But the problem isn't the law. The law is good. The problem is with us. God calls each of us, in whatever vocation we are, married, uh, unmarried, or post-marriage, to be chaste, that is, holy and pure in thought, word, and deed. But we're not. Now, maybe we are according to outward appearances. Maybe we look outwardly pure and clean. Um, But we have sin that's, that's real deep, each one of us. And we can't fix ourselves by working harder at it. But we think we can. We think we can find the power within ourselves uh, to be a better person according to the outward working of the law and keeping of the law. But while it's promising at first with all its regulations and lists, the law eventually just sucks all the joy right out of life by ultimately revealing the imperfection in us, which when taken seriously produces shame. And this is what makes so much of Christianity today so sad. Because many Christians think that Jesus came to be a new lawgiver, a new Moses, to tell us how to live. And the result is that we think we are called to be moral policemen and and to launch moral improvement campaigns, especially against the sexual culture of the world. But no moral campaign can fix this mess. We can't make ourselves holy. God alone is holy. And so God, in Christ, is going to reveal something at this wedding. He's going to show us an epiphany of who he is and what he's come to do. Jesus tells the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. When the master of the banquet tasted the wine, or tasted the water, It had become wine. And no one except the servants, not even the master, not even the groom, knew what Jesus had done. Yet Jesus does what the groom should have done in the first place. Jesus is the substitute for the groom. And in so doing, saved both groom and bride from immense shame and restored their dignity. Jesus is not a new Moses in the sense of being a new lawgiver. He's a new Moses in the sense that he is holy, and he is going to be the substitute for Moses and for each one of us. Like those six stone water jars, Jesus fills the law and demands of Moses 
with his own perfect life. And then he draws out of those jars something wonderful, not more laws, but something new. Wine. Joyous wine. And he pours out for you in, with, and under wine the same blood that was shed for you on the cross. So what word does Christ have for those men and women who have been shamed or victimized or defiled by sexual sin and abuse? What word does Christ have for the countless broken souls who have indulged in illicit sex and and now stagger under a seemingly insurmountable mountain of guilt, hurt, remorse, and shame regarding their own bodies? What word does Christ have for those husbands and wives that experience pain and hurt in their marriage, concluding that everything must be broken and the most broken thing of all is their own body? What, what, what word does Christ have uh, for, for those couples who are struggling to escape their adulterous addictions? What word does Christ have for all of these? The word that is shown by his miraculous sign. Restoration. The God who made creation and instituted marriage steps in to restore creation. He miraculously changes water into the abundance of the very best wine. And he has taken you not through a, a ceremonial cleansing of the, of the law, which only makes you appear clean, but he has baptized you. He has made you thoroughly clean, inwardly clean. He has sanctified you. That is, he has set you apart as holy and pure and clean. And not just clean, but new. As St. Paul says in Titus 3, 5-8, to according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And again in Romans 6, 4, we are buried with Christ by baptism into death, that just as he was raised up by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. In Christ, your shame is gone. Your sin is gone. You are a new person, a new creation. In Christ, you can walk a new life. You can escape your sin and escape your past. And so you, as a baptized Christian, are privileged to taste and see that the Lord is good. And you have a foretaste of the heavenly wedding banquet that will never end. And in hearing the word, being baptized, partaking of the very best wine that this world has to offer because it is Jesus himself. What these things do is reveal Jesus' glory to you and me. See, these create in us a true miracle, faith. That's the real miracle here at the wedding of Cana. His disciples believed in him. To believe in him in, in that moment, amidst all the chaos of this wedding, at the possible shame and embarrass, embarrassment that's now been relieved, to now know and believe that this Jesus, that is the Lord of creation, who is now standing in their midst in order to restore the creation that has fallen. It's this same Jesus who is at the wedding of Cana at a, at a, as an invited guest, who, is, who, as the groom, gave his life for the bride, his church, on the cross. This same Jesus is here today to feed you with the bread that is his body and to gladden your hearts with the wine that is his blood for the complete forgiveness of all your sins and to bring you joy overflowing and unending so that you might experience the miracle in Cana here today. That you are sanctified, restored, and by faith in him, you are a new creation. In Jesus' name, amen.